object words even, because it's not just simple objects, it's a whole object words, means fossilization of the existing ones. It is a process in which, because of the speed of the innovations, older generations of technologies and of experiences get faster and faster disconnected from the present. In short, the past get decoupled from the present. At the same time, by investing and spending more and more resources of the planet, building huge infrastructures, we also use up the future. That means we cut ourselves of two major time resources. The past, which is important in order to develop socially shared meaning. The future, which provides a resource for utopian thinking. We are left with a flat presence and a high speed. This basically characterizes characterizes the Anthropocenic world from the perspective of time. It is a time where, because of the fugitive character, we are searching for measurements to understand the situation we are in. Taking into account the Anthropocene world developed basically in the last 100 years, the project 100 years of now is an attempt to revisit, to reassess these 100 years
are in some way going into reverse in the UK. We're now, in fact, entering a period in which there is once again a very dominant analytical mainstream. The second thing about radical philosophy was that it aimed to introduce these European philosophical resources uh, into the intellectual discourses of the left uh, and to try to uh, in some way offer a broad set of intellectual and cultural resources uh, for the politics of the 70s and 80s. Both of these things are still relevant I think, particularly uh, questions about curriculum reform. We have a, uh, a piece in the current issue about what's going on in uh, economics departments, uh, particularly in the UK, but also in America, Canada, and France as well, where economics, in some sense, is a discipline which is much uh, like philosophy was 40 or 50 years ago, which is it's a discipline uh, which bears no relation to the current uh, social reality and its object. Um, so we hope to, if you like, extend our tradition uh, by continuing covering uh, movements for educational reform as well as student politics. The second thing I should say, because I did a couple of interviews um, with the press last night and this morning, uh, and, and the main thing, the main initial object of fascination for the uh, journalist that I spoke to uh, was the apparently historical character of our subtitle. The journal uh, is, is still subtitled the Journal of Socialist and Feminist Philosophy. And all the journalists said, you know, how, how could you have hung on to this subtitle since 1972? Well, actually, we didn't have this subtitle in 1972. Radical philosophy never had a subtitle. Uh, journals like History Workshop, which were kind of related journals, had subtitles like the Journal of Socialist and Feminist Historians. What happened in the UK after 1989 uh, was that all these journals suddenly and without editorial comment dropped their subtitles uh, and they disappeared. So what Radical Philosophy rather quixotically uh, did in 1992 was add the subtitle the Journal of Socialist and Feminist uh, Philosophy. So it needs to be borne in mind that if you like it's not, the, it's not the remainder of a long history. It's the residue of a polemical refusal to uh, treat 1989 as some kind of definitive political break uh, that in some sense had absolutely changed all uh, political terrains. Uh, the other thing to be said uh, about the journal's relation to the left in terms of the fact that we're, we're uh, uh, still a self-published, collectively produced journal, is that it does residually allow us to appeal to a broader kind of para-academic public of a size that we, we see in this room today, which is a, uh, an incredible uh, audience for something that might be described perhaps erroneously as a philosophy conference. Um, this has been helped, I think, by, uh, by the development of our, of our website. And one thing I've been asked to uh, announce or remind people of is that the, um, uh, the app for Android and uh, iPads, which allows you to download uh, the journal, uh, is, has a geolocation function, which means that everywhere within 150 meters, I think it is, of this auditorium, uh, you can download uh, the last year's issues, so I think six or seven issues for free, if you so desire. Um, that'll be on for the course of the conference, so if people want to uh, have direct free access to the journal, um, we hope you'll do that. A couple of quick things about the conference. Um, radical philosophy conferences are often, it's often remarked how unphilosophical they are relative to philosophy conferences. Uh, we, we, in some sense, consider that with a certain pride insofar as a certain kind of philosophy is constituted on the basis of a kind of principle of ignorance about the world. Um, so we, we organise our conferences generally around what we take to be the uh, main uh, debates of the day, whether they, those be fashionable debates, uh, on which we might wish to throw a little 
or whether they be uh, topics which are in some sense uh, a more political urgency, such as topics uh, to do with surveillance and secrecy, or whether they're topics which represent a kind of continuation of our own uh, cultural history, uh, particularly the, the pedagogization topic. Um, and the way that the conference has been structured is that, is that each session has been organized by a different member of the collective will either be speaking at it or chairing it. Uh, and it, each session has three speakers, one from radical philosophy or designated by radical philosophy, one speaker from Germany, generally from, from Berlin, and then a third speaker. So that they've been set up in a kind of, um, according to a kind of arbitrary rule uh, for the triangulation of debate. Uh, and we hope that there will be some uh, conflicting uh, views amongst the speakers. We're also hoping that there'll be a minimum of 20 to 30 minutes discussion after each panel. So we're going to try and keep the speakers quite tightly to 20 to 25 minutes so that we get at least 20 and hopefully 30 minutes um, discussion from the floor afterwards. Finally, uh, to end these introductory remarks, we're hoping um, that we'll probably publish some sets of the papers in the journal in the course of the year. Uh, but more immediately, the, uh, the event will be recorded and the audio files uh, will be uploaded and they'll be available uh, both via the uh, uh, HKW uh, website and also via the RP website. So uh, if you missed sessions, you, you will have access to them fairly immediately. And at this point, I'd like to uh, ask the participants from the first panel to Biographies for the speakers. Um, we're not going to read out the speakers' Bravo. biographies which you've got in front of you. I'll, I'll just identify the relevant subject position that they occupy. <laughs> in the sense that David Cunningham is sitting uh, in the middle, uh, is the member of the Radical Philosophy Collective who, uh, whose idea it was and who organised this session. Um, Frank uh, Engstler, sitting to his right, uh, is the, uh, the Berlin representative triangulation of discussions. Uh, and Nina is in the, uh, the everybody else position. <laughs> That's Nina Powell, who um, is also from London. Uh, the order we're going to take this in is that Frank is going to speak first, uh, then David, then Nina, uh, and then we'll have general discussion afterwards. And hopefully they'll uh, keep to time, and if not, they'll have to speak. Yeah, thanks for the invitation. Uh, we almost told 30 minutes, so I have to accelerate my speech a little bit to start with the first joke. Uh, the title of my speech is The Condition of Acceleration, Money as a Technique of Measurement. Undoubtedly, the phenomenology of what could be called acceleration is omnipresent. In all sectors of society, on the level of appearance, we can observe an ongoing acceleration. But this raises a question, is there an underlying logic which appears in the phenomenology of acceleration? My thesis is that we can utilize Marx's critique of the political economy to find such a systematic logic in what necessarily appears as the vast phenomenology of acceleration. Also, if in a post-Hegelian age there is a fear of speaking about logic in the context of social phenomena, and historical dynamics. Moreover, I hold that not only there is a logic of acceleration, but we can also find its starting point in Marx. This is because the starting point of the logic of acceleration is at the same time its historical starting point, which means that this entanglement of logic and history produces a certain history of which accelerationism is a part. This entanglement between logic and history must be taken as immediate as possible since this entanglement, and this will, not, will be my thesis for today, lies in the logic to measure productivity by time. I want to show that this type of measurement is both a temporal logic and at once a temporalization of time itself. I want to use this logic of me measurement to develop what I 
think is missing in the actual debate on acceler accelerationism, which is so astonished by the phenomenology of acceleration that it can't see the condition of its constitution. This inability points to what in my view is generally lacking, not only in the debates about accelerationism or its counterpart, Negro, but in radical criticism in general, the systematic categorical dimension of critique. I start with such a categorical critique by posing the following questions. What are the conditions in which acceleration is measured through time? And where is the starting point of this entanglement between logic and history constituted by measurement through time? And I claim the following. Acceleration is a phenomenon that arose when money started to measure the valorization of labor. To understand this measurement, it is necessary to look at its two sides. We have to look on the one side at money, which became a measure in capitalist society. And we have to look on the other side at what became the object of measurement, and the object is the valorization of labor by capital. By bringing both sides together, the measure and the measured object, we arrive at the form of measurement the form is that money realizes the results of this valorization, the commodities, as values. This form entails our social mediation, constitutes the sphere of circulation and the cycle of economic reproduction. These three basic elements of a measuring process, the measure, its object, and the form of measurement, could ground the whole theory of acceleration starting with the valorization of labor and capital, going to the form of reali realizing its products as values through money, and returning the, these realized values to the valorization process in which money, which money metaphorizes back into these realized values. Of course, I can elaborate the whole process and the whole economy of measuring here, but I want to provide a broad overview by presenting it in a trial of three thesis. The first thesis will be the starting point of measuring the valorization of labor through time is the so-called primitive accumulation. The second will be money became a measure of this valorization, quantifying it and constituting an abstract and valorized time. And finally the third, by changing this relation between labor and capital, it, uh, it's, its productive power can be increased, and in the last instance, it is this change that appears as the phenomenon of acceleration. If this trial seems very dense and complicated, we should keep in mind that it is merely presenting our everyday life, the technique inside our own economy and its acceleration. So if I had to write an accelerationist manifesto, Thanks. I would found it in these theses. I would ground accelerationism on an economy that measures itself through time and write an economic instead of a political manifesto. Okay, so much to frame the economy of measurement. Let's start with my first thesis, which concerns the logical and historical starting point of measurement and acceleration. It holds that capitalist society is radically different from all former societies because it is the only society to possess a valorization process. This process started with what Marx defined as so-called primitive accumulation. What is this primitive accumulation? According to Marx, to initiate valorization, a separation was decisive, namely the separation of the producers from their means of production. This mostly violent separation was decisive because the relationship between producers and their means of production were transformed into something totally new and different in the whole history of humanity, a process of social production as a relation between two elements of value. Now on the one side of this totally new relation, producers are commodities who sell their labor time. To be exact, the labor force sells their capability to produce more value than they themselves need for their reproduction. Because of this capacity to produce more or surplus value, Marx calls the labor force variable capital. And on the other side, the means of production also enter in the valorization of this labor power as a value. They enter as value simply because 
because they themselves are already products of labor and therefore have already certain values. But in contrast to the labor force, the means of production don't produce new value. On the contrary, during commodity production, they transfer their own already produced values to the produced commodities. This is why Marx calls the means only constant capital. So strangely, there is no acceleration so far on the side of the means of production. On the contrary, there is only a continuity. We see already what is important for our interest in acceleration. This relation of labor and its means when taken as variable and constant capital is a temporal relation, as is already implied in the terms variable and constant. Irrespective of their differences, concrete acts of labor, peasant work, industrial work, and material work, and as different means of production, tools, machines, programs, as pure values, they both incorporate and reify time. The labor force on the one side incorporates living present labor time, and the means of production on the other side are already spent dead labor time. So the deparation created by primitive accumulation was also the establishment of a kind of self-relation between living and dead labor of the present and the past of our labor time. Perhaps we can even turn this around. It is time itself that enters into a self-relation through these two elements. All the labor forces and all their means of production share and divide the same time, but they build two different classes of time. The class of present and the class of past labor time. The labor forces subjectify and embody present time, and the figures of capital objectify and reify the past of this present. This leads to my second thesis, which is that exactly this relation became the object of measurement, and to measure this relation became the specific capitalist function of money. Whatever money was in pre-capitalist societies, in capitalist society it measures the valorization process that started by primitive accumulation. It not only measures and realizes its results, which is the value of all the various commodities, in doing so, it also determines and establishes the decisive magnitudes for the valorization of these two elements. On the one side of labor, it establishes the average necessary labor time, and on the side of the employed capital, it establishes an average profit and builds a profit rate. However this measurement may function, to grasp it, one fundamental con condition needs to be understood. Prior to the temporal relations of labor and capital, and prior to its measurement, is that money quantifies. Quantification is an a priori for our capitalist society, because by quantifying, money gives time. Money gives time in the strong sense of a gift, and it gives time even in a twofold way. Firstly, it gives time as a universal measure, and secondly, this time is always already given as an abstract homogeneous time because of its quantification. Putting the two together means that the quality of a negative, pure identical or self-identical time is given by its quantification. Therefore, money always gives time in a fitted way, and thanks to my first thesis, we know now what is given in this finite, quantified time. The quantity is determined by measuring the productivity of the relation in production. The quantities money presents are in the last instance the relation between living and dead labor that money is giving us by quantifying their results, results or we can even say is giving us back. So money not only transfers and maintains quantitative magnitudes in time, it maintains and transfers time itself in a quantitative way giving us a specific and socialized time resulting from the relations between our labor and the employed capital. In sum, money converts time into quantity and vice versa, it converts quantity into time. However we understand this conversion, it is impossible to establish an economy of time without money because time is not out there, it is not a natural resource we can harvest and use. It's the other way around. 
time is an identical quality is transformed into a resource by quantifying and it is exactly this quantifying that is harvested and physically manifest in money. With this conversion of quantity and time, money constitutes a whole economy of time. It is as if money uses time to measure a productive process that exactly because of that measurement enters into relations of time. So not only does money convert quantity in time and vice versa, this also leads to a conversion in which the labor and the means of production enter in temporal relations and vice versa. Time relations are embodied in these labor forces and in this means building a relation between present and past. These time relations are decisive because the productive power of our capitalist society lies in them. Consequently, the increase of productive power must also lie in these relations and this increase is what we can call acceleration. This leads to the third and last thesis. To increase productivity, hence to produce acceleration, we have to change the relations of production. According to Marx, this comes about simply by reducing the labor time necessary for the production of commodities. All the machines and tools, all the techniques and programs on the side of capital are reducing labor time necessary for the commodity production and this appears as increasing productivity and acceleration. This sounds simple and logical, more commodities or more output per time. But the crucial point is tricky and often overlooked. Pro productivity is not increased by more or better commodities per time. This would be the same positivistic view that doesn't see a temporal relation in labor and its means of production. Consequently, when we see in the figure of labor and capital a temporal relation, then we have to find out what the reduction of labor time means for their relation. Why is it productive for this relation and its circles to reduce labor time and to produce more per time? According to Marx, it is productive because it reduces not only the values of the commodities produced, but with this it reduces the cost of the one and only productive commodity, the labor force itself. This particular commodity and its costs of reproduction is a crucial lever for productivity. The commodity form of our labor is, as I said before, the decisive variable part in the whole economy of time. All our means and the techniques that seem to increase power and that seem to accelerate are not productive because although we can produce more or better things with them, they are productive because we are reducing reproduction costs for the labor force. The labor force not only determines in all the produced commodities its own value, it determines also the value of its means of production the same means that provide these labor forces with productive power and that increases power. But this reduction alone is only half the truth of productivity and acceleration. The other half is that reducing the reproduction costs of the labor force sets time free for surplus labor time. Marx called this surplus labor time surplus value or when it's realized profit and it is this surplus time that in capitalism gets exploited. It gets exploited, but this time gets first of all, before any capitalist can appropriate it, exploited by money. Money then not only measures the, rela the relation of present and past labor time, as I have stated until now, it also exploits this reduced necessary labor time, winning it as surplus time in a pure quantum. However this may function, what must fascinate us is that in capitalist society, money obviously exploits a certain quantum of time and holds its identical in time. This time is won and doesn't get lost, but this exploited time remains in time only when it returns to the valorization process and expands it. Money only maintains this quantified surplus time when this quantum gets con converted again in the two elements of valorization, expanding their reproduction.
production. This expansion occurs not only quantitatively, but also qualitatively by finding new and better forms to embody the relation between present and past time. That means better forms to embody and subjectify labor time, like programs instead of peasants, or better forms to reify its already spent labor time in the means of production, like computers instead of hammers. We see that this leads to a self-closing and at the same time self-expanding circle. And this circle, or better say this spiral, appears as acceleration. But to really understand acceleration within the spiral, we always have to hold in mind that all the concrete forms are building this spiral because they embody and reify temporal relations. That's why Marx divides valorization into technical and organic composition. The technical concerns all the reifications and embodiments and the means of production and the labor forces, while the organic is their pure quantitative relation and therefore their temporal relation. In the term organic, we literally hear this time relation, as organic usually refers to something living that grows and emerges and accelerates out of itself. Or in short, this organic composition is like a subject. Like a subject because when the organs of the technical composition change, the organic composition of the value relation and as a time relation is also changing. Industrial workers and the forms of industrial capital like machines compose a different time relation than immaterial labor, computers or the dematerialized figures of finance capital. But again, I have to insist that this subjectivity and this organic composition can't live without money. The organic composition and all its changes have to be measured and constantly converted in quantity by money. It is this constant measurement and conversion where the increasing of power and the acceleration starts. And with this realization of the organic composition and its subjectivity by money, I finally can come back to my statement in the introduction that accelerationism is too much focused on the acceleration by all the techniques and therefore it can't see what is, to paraphrase Heidegger, the purely technique in all forms of technique or the technique as such money. Money is a purely technical in all, in the whole economy of time. All the other technologies of tools or machines or programs are productive and accelerate because they reduce time. And with this reduction, it is possible to produce surplus time and use the surplus time to expand our reproduction. But this is only possible because we quantify the relation between this technological and organic composition and thereby convert them into time relations, and this technique is given by money. So in my conviction from this logic to measure with money through time and to convert time in quantitative relations, we could reconstruct the logic or the technique in the phenomenology of acceleration. And we could draw further important consequences to understand acceleration consequences, which I only can mention briefly here in conclusion. We could, for example, show that Fordism was in general an acceleration that took place in the production of relative surplus value, while in post-Fordism, neoliberalism and finance capitalism, acceleration mainly takes place in forms of production of absolute surplus value. Thus, in the last decade, there was a shift from more civilized forms of exploitation, as Marx called the forms of relative surplus production, to the uncivilized forms of the absolute value. It is also a shift to less productive forms because the production of absolute value is based on the extension of the number of labor forces, the extension of their labor time, and on worsening their wages, as we perhaps all notice. Or we could show that the quantified first nature is productive and accelerates because it enters into the quantified second nature of our society and its valorization process. Meanwhile, not only the quantification of nature enters in our quantified economy, the same goes for digitalized codes and programs. And even the future gets valorized and enters right now into our economy and accelerates it. Finance capital and the credit system 
valorize a future in such a way that they anticipate a future valorization and a future profit that exactly because of the, this anticipation has to occur and that has to be activated and mobilized. In other words, right now we are in debt by a valorized future from which we bought time and into which we therefore have to enter. The future is not unwritten. And we could also show that acceleration is, as I tried to show, temporalization by measuring through time. But for this temporalization, time itself must remain timeless. So we will never escape capitalism if we always use the same physical time to measure and determine our productivity. On the contrary, we will endless ride, time will endless ride its own history. A time that is embodied in the means of production and in the labor forces, building here its own temporal relations. Such a time is writing its own history in an immediate way. However this history may appear, the time will always be the same, being quantified by money and becoming the identical quality of our society or the quality of identity itself. So this may be my conclusion. Every acceleration is based on what an acceleration actually remains timeless, time itself. It is a nature given, quantifiable, but all at once a specifically capitalist time that through money became a measure. Time became the most universal and superable measure of all times. Thank you.